Welcome. Today I'll be discussing propositional logic, and in the series to come, we'll be going over propositional logic using a replacement method. However, there are many other ways to do propositional logic as well. I've picked out five other methods that are common that you may encounter as a point of comparison. Different methods prepare students in different ways for math they may encounter in the future. The methods we'll look at I will call Carroll, Genson, Fitch, Post, and Truth Trees. It should be noted that this is not an exhaustive list of approaches to logic, but I have my reasons for picking out these ones to discuss. I could not find any reliable source on who came up with truth trees, also known as negated decomposition or semantic tableaus. It may have been Everett Beth, or Hating, or Dodson building on the work of Ladd Franklin, or some other individual entirely. In any event, they work in a rather peculiar way. If you want to see if a formula is a tautology, that is, true for all statements A, B, C, etc., then this method suggests that you negate the statement and then follow these rules. And if at the end you are left with contradictions along the branches, then the original statement is true, like this. So we start by writing out the statement we want to prove. Here, this is the contrapositive rule. And then we negate it. Now we see that our statement takes the form of negated implication. So we find the appropriate rule and apply it. Here, P implies Q is the first term in our negated implication. And Q implies P plays the role of the second. Next, we could use our rules for implication on what is now the second row here, but that is a branching rule, so it'll be most efficient of us to save it for last. So instead, we're going to use our negated implication rule again, but this time on row 3. And after applying the double negative rule to row 5, the only thing left to do is expand on row 2. Now along the left branch, we can see that we have a P and a not P, so here we have a contradiction. And along the right branch, we have a Q and a not Q, so again we have a contradiction. And now that we've found a contradiction along every branch, we have proven our original statement. So why does this work? While it might make sense intuitively to a student to look for a counterexample to the opposite of something to show that it's true, and I emphasize the word might, I can't imagine trying to explain what each of these rules are doing to a student who as of yet does not understand propositional logic. And then of course an obnoxiously intelligent student might ask the question, why do we need a contradiction on all branches? Isn't one counterexample enough? To which of course is a very good answer for. And that's that we lied about looking for counterexamples. That's not what these rules of inference give us at all. What we're actually doing is looking for every possible way for the opposite of a statement to be true. Finding none, we conclude that negation is false in every situation, which means that its negation, the original statement, must be true in each of those situations. So our original statement is a tautology. By the way, this visualization of the rules is adapted from Curtis Haga of ifp-then-q.net. There are a number of resources on YouTube for truth trees, and I even saw them once on a study guide that someone was selling, so they must be relatively common, but I find them to be extremely esoteric. Using them doesn't really build any thinking skills in large part because they are so esoteric, and as far as I know, they don't really provide any transferable skills, and although there are additional rules for dealing with some statements and predicate logic, as I understand it, this method won't always work. Additionally, I'm sure you could come up with rules for dealing with fully quantified propositional logic, but I'm not sure if there are any resources for that. Also, starting from the outside of a statement involving parentheses and working your way in might seem backwards and strange to students who are used to doing the opposite when evaluating arithmetic expressions. On the plus side, however, this particular proof of the contrapositive rule has the advantage that it looks a little bit like a dog. On the other end of the spectrum, there are methods like Fitch, which is a wonderful method that sets us up for thinking about how we get from one place in a proof to the next place in a proof. Fitch style proofs work through inference rules, but unlike truth trees, you are actually inferring things that follow from the previous statements. Additionally, Fitch has a structure to it which emphasizes the concept of implications, hypotheses, and conclusions. For example, here is the contrapositive rule again. The long vertical lines help keep track of how statements are nested, and whenever there is a line below something, that indicates that what is above is some sort of temporary assumption. Every other statement has to follow from statements either directly above them or on previous layers and above according to the rules. But our temporary assumptions can be whatever we want. In order to prove the contrapositive rule, we need to first make three different nested assumptions. Now, since we are assuming both P and if P then Q, we can learn Q. After adding numbers to each line, we can properly cite this as an application of our rule MP, or modus ponens, to lines 1 and 3. Then line 2 and 4 give us a contradiction, and since we assumed P on line 3 and found a contradiction on line 5, our assumption of P must have been incorrect, so we can learn not P. 
Since we assumed not q on line 2 and showed that not p followed, we can say that not q implied not p. And similarly, we can finish off our proof of the contrapositive rule. And from here, we can just do a one-to-one -one translation of a Fitch style proof into a classical written proof. By the way, this visualization of the rules is taken from Peter Smith of logicmatters.net, who has some useful resources on his website. But it's also worth noting that one of these rules is unnecessary, as it only exists to introduce a symbol that then only one other rule ingests. So we can actually shorten this up slightly like this, where we just use any statement of the form gamma and not gamma in place of the false constant. Additionally, you can go on to easily talk about predicate logic within Fitch with just a few more inference rules, which is another really nice property. There are also some great resources online and on YouTube. In particular, I would direct you to the videos by William Rose at Montgomery Blair High School, who has created some nice video examples of Fitch style proofs, which could act as nice resources for students who need help. The Fitch system is fairly easy to use. The problem with it, as I see it, is that it can require a certain degree of creativity. And for students who are not necessarily going on to use mathematical proofs, it may not exercise many transferable skills. And of course, it is based around the concept of implication, which can be a confusing concept at first to students who are new to propositional logic. Jensen is commonly used in proof theory for reasons that are beyond the scope of this video. But for those of you who are interested, I recommend checking out Tim Leon's first video introduction to proof theory over on the Computational Logic Group TU Dresden YouTube channel. We could continue to use the same inference rules but in Gensen's style, which is done in one of Gensen's original list of rules. Note here that spaces mean and, and the things above the horizontal lines imply the things below, except for the two horizontal lines used for organization. And these are the same rules which we saw with Fitch a moment ago. Uh, except that one, that one isn't needed. But more modern versions of Gensen's sequent calculus are organized somewhat differently. And before we go any further, I'll note that the notation is perhaps not very helpful in the way that it looks like division and fractions, which is a natural connection for students to make when they're first seeing Gensen, but there just isn't any relation there. Now, like Fitch, Gensen is heavily reliant on the concept of implication. For instance, each line in Gensen's system can be converted into a statement, and each line's statement always implies the next. But more than this, Gensen uses several different symbols for implication in different contexts. Of course, we have the arrow, as we've already seen, used to mean implication, and then we have the horizontal line as well. But there is also a third symbol that we will need to talk about called the turnstile, often read as proves. Of course, in a properly formulated logic, glossing over some specifics here, a statement proves another if it implies it, and if a statement can be used to prove another, then it implies it. So the two notions are equivalent in most contexts. Another strange symbol we will encounter with Gensen is the comma. It is particularly odd because its meaning is contextual. When located on the left of a turnstile, it is equivalent to an and, whereas on the right, it is equivalent to an or. I should also note that when the turnstile has nothing on its left, it is treated as if there is a logical truth on the left. And when there is nothing on the right, well, that's not really done, but I suppose you would treat it as if there's a logical false on the right. And once again, the typical sequent calculus does not quantify its statements, or rather it operates as if they were all quantified universally out in front. Only when working with first order statements do quantifiers make an appearance. Here's a more typical list of inference rules for Gensen's system. The capital Greek letters stand in for any finite list of comma-separated statements, including potentially no statement at all. And once again, here's a proof of the contrapositive rule. This is built up from the bottom up, although normally read from the top down. To construct it, you use the rules to get rid of each operator, saving the branching rules for last. The main advantage to Gensen, I think, is that it is used by people studying more advanced topics in logic, and it certainly does have a few nice properties for one working in those areas of mathematics. One of the most common ways of learning propositional logic is with truth tables, which here I'm attributing to Post, even though a number of people came up with them simultaneously, just because ML Post was one of the first who used them in proofs about completeness and consistency. Truth tables themselves are useful ways of organizing information about propositions, and in particular have practical applications when working with integrated circuits. In fact, most students who have taken a computer programming course will have had some exposure to truth tables already. So how do we use truth tables? We start by setting up our table with the component statements that we are using in the statement that we want to prove. And then each row of the table we're going to consider a different case. Here are all the different possible combinations for two variables. Next, to look at the statement I want to prove. We'll need a column for it, as well as a column for the two smaller statements that it's built out of, and for the statements that they're built out of. And now I can go along row by row evaluating each column based on the information in the same row from the previous columns. Here's what we should get. And now you see that in every case, our target statement was true. 
Therefore, it is always true no matter what the values of P and Q happen to be. The most common question I get from students learning to use truth tables is, what should I use as my columns? Especially as students get better and no longer need to have a column for every single input into another operator, and other students will really struggle with what even that means. So truth tables are a very common way of doing propositional logic, and although the thinking skills involved are minimal, doing it efficiently can take a bit of creativity. Additionally, proving a statement using truth tables can be somewhat long and tedious. I would also say that truth tables don't really support other areas of mathematics very well, beyond just being able to evaluate expressions involving statements, and I suppose knowing how to count in binary. Also, working with quantified Boolean formulas in truth tables is difficult and confusing, and truth tables can't really work at all with first-order logic. Carroll's method is a form of categorical logic described in his 1896 book, Symbolic Logic which, as far as I know, is the second book to use that title after the phrase was coined by John Venn 15 years earlier in his work under the same title. Because categorical logics are based on syllogisms, they may be more readily applicable to everyday life than other propositional and first-order logics that we've looked at so far. Statements, as per Carroll, are made up of four parts. The quantifier, here those are some, no, or all. The subject, the cupola, which is the word is or are. And fourthly, the predicate. The subjects and predicates are both objects that refer to a class. Here we could say some swans are brown, where the subject is swans, in reference to the class of things that are swans, and the predicate is brown, referring to the class of things which are brown. Sometimes statements have to be rewritten slightly to be in this format. For instance, one could write the statement, your base belongs to us, as all things that are your base are things that belong to us. From here, Carroll wants to use this framework to discuss existence in general. So instead of saying some things that exist are things that have attribute x, he creates the abbreviation x sub 1. And instead of writing no things that exist are things that have attribute x, he writes x sub 0. Interestingly, he gives no shorthand for the analogous statement that begins all things that exist are, etc. Although I suppose that such a statement would have very limited usefulness. Carroll then notes that rather than saying some x are y, one could just say some x, y exist, where x, y refers to things with both attributes. For example, x could be brown and y could be swans, and then to express the existence of brown swans, one could just write x, y sub 1. If we wanted to say not brown, Carroll suggests using a dash, so x dash y sub 1 would say some not brown swans exist. For another example, if one wanted to assert all unicorns are pretty, we could call unicorns u, pretty things p, and say no not pretty unicorns exist, like this, p dash u sub zero, or equivalently u p dash sub zero. The order doesn't really matter there. However, Carroll actually recommends that statements such as all unicorns are pretty should also assert the existence of pretty unicorns, which is not a very modern construction. But to do this, we would simultaneously need to assert u p dash sub zero as well as u sub one, unicorns exist. And to do this, Carol uses a dagger, but instead here I'll use the more typical symbol for and. Similarly, one could use the more standard arrow for implication rather than the reverse pill crow, which Carol uses. Carol also makes the suggestion that we can squish these two statements together to get u sub one p dash sub zero, where each of the subscripts is read back to the beginning of the statement. This aids in translation. Unfortunately, our example of the contraposite rule is not really the sort of statement that Carroll's method is designed to prove. Instead, Carroll's method is designed to produce a conclusion, when there is one, from at least two premises involving at least three classes by means of a diagram or three-ish rules of inference. Let's go through an example, and here we will start with the table method. If we start with the premises, all diligent students are successful, and all ignorant students are unsuccessful, we can call m successful, x diligent, and y ignorant, and so we will have all x are m, and all y are not m. This breaks down into four statements, as we have seen. First, we start with the null statements and put an o in the corresponding places in the upper diagram to indicate that we know that nothing exists in these locations. Notice that the events corresponding to m are on the inside and the ones corresponding to not m are on the outside ring of cells. Next, for the statements marked 1, we can put a single i through the corresponding cells in the diagram that are not already occupied by an o. Note that in some examples this means an i might have to bridge two cells of the diagram, but not in this example. 
Next, we can summarize the upper diagram on the lower diagram, where we can put an O in a quadrant if there are two O's corresponding to the same quadrant in the larger diagram. And we can put an I only if there is at least one I completely inside the corresponding quadrant in the upper diagram. Now we could write down three conclusions from the lower summary diagram like so. But there's a simpler way to write this information, and being simpler will aid in translation. To find the simpler statement, we start by writing down the statements for the O's in the diagram. And to prevent redundant conclusions, we allow adjacent I's to float partially into the cell occupied by that O. If there are two O's adjacent to an I, we would need to duplicate that I so that it can drift partially into both adjacent cells. Next, we read off the statements corresponding to the I's. And these are our conclusions. You may recognize that x, y sub 0 and the x sub 1 can be combined. But remembering that x, y sub 0 is the same thing as y, x sub 0, you can see that the first and third statements can also be combined to give us just x1, y sub 0 and y1, x sub 0. In other words, all x are not y and all y are not x. Or, all diligent students are not ignorant and all ignorant students are not diligent. So that we don't have to use the diagrams, Carroll provides three rules of inference. Going back to the previous example, we can use the first rule on the first and third statements and carry over the other two to get the same conclusion as before. Actually, we should look at the third rule more closely for a second. If we make the statement m1 more redundant by making it mm1, that would be like saying that there exists diligent, diligent people, then we can see that when we use rule 2 on the second and third statements here, we get the conclusion y dash m sub 1. And then we can apply rule 2 again to get x dash y dash sub 1. The same conclusion as rule 3 without using rule 3. Thus, rule 3 is not actually needed. But now that we are recognizing statements with the same subject and predicate, we should probably add an axiom that says that things that are both x and not x do not exist, since we couldn't have shown that with the other two rules. Also, we should note that if two things exist together, then they also exist apart, but that's more of a structural rule, really. The reason I wanted to go over Carroll's system is that I have seen several texts that start by introducing categorical logic by noting that statements often begin with no, some, or all, but then do not explain how those systems work and the four rules in 15 valid argument forms, which Carroll nimbly makes obsolete anyway, and instead they attempt to seamlessly transition into discussing truth tables or truth trees as if those were the same kinds of statements. One could instead teach students Carroll's approach to syllogisms, and in some senses it might be more directly useful in everyday life than the other logical systems we've looked at, but I really doubt that anyone would ever really start translating statements and using the rules or making a diagram when they happen to encounter syllogisms in the wild. And if the point of learning logic is instead supposed to be in the intuition we learn along the way, I think that Carroll's method might be slightly esoteric and procedural in a way that sidesteps that intuition, but that's just my own opinion. Additionally, I would point out that, as with all categorical logic, the way Carroll's diagrams work is rather three-valued, with O's, I's, and blank cells representing a lack of knowledge. The lack of this last feature may confuse students who try to go on to learn other forms of propositional logic. And lastly, the inability to work with OR statements does somewhat limit the usefulness of Carroll's logic in everyday life. Now that you know a little more about some of the other methods used with mathematical logic, we are now ready to look in more depth at one method in particular, which both mirrors how many mathematicians actually treat propositions in practice and builds on a lot of the algebra skills and the notion of equality, but does not have very many resources for it besides one short description on the Wikipedia page for true quantified Boolean formula. The replacement method that we will look at in the following videos gets students to practice plugging things into functions, evaluating expressions using parentheses, and making substitutions on a context that is not the algebra that may have become monotonous to them. Additionally, the replacement method is extremely formal and can be applied to first-order logic. Please subscribe and hit the bell icon to not miss my next video, an introduction into propositional logic using a replacement method.